Well, hello. Welcome to the Great Stories Podcast. Thank you so much for clicking on this episode. I'm excited that you are listening today. My name is Ryan Weber. I'm the creator slash host and chief bungler of all things podcast related. Um, I came up with this thing. The idea is that we are doing interviews with real people, uh, talking about their stories, their their life stories, usually, sometimes a little more specific, as is the case today. But the, the whole concept is that we just really want to take an authentic peek into what it's been like for a real human being to come to know Christ, to follow Him, and just what their journey uh, as a Christ follower has been like. These are real, authentic conversations with real people. They're unscripted, unedited, uncut, uh, and especially unrehearsed. We rabbit trail. We talk about all kinds of things. It's super fun. But the biggest thing we talk about is just what what Jesus is doing in the lives of these people, what they witness, what they see, how they get to participate. It is super fun. Uh, if you hear something you like, uh, that's kind of the idea. I hope you do. Uh, you can share these episodes uh, on Facebook or you can just text them to each other, text links around. That's how the show grows. And, and I want this thing to be, uh, I, want it, I want it to get huge. <laughs> Not so that Ryan Weber can be great or the Great Stories podcast can be great, but so that the God that we are talking about here on every episode can be known. Uh, and these stories, I think, are just a great way to communicate that. If you want to support the show in other ways, we have a, a Patreon account. Uh, you can just search for The Great Stories Podcast there if you want to throw a few bucks down the way. This is a pretty cheap way uh, to do this thing. Podcasts are not expensive. But if you want to help with the overhead and just keep the thing floating, that would be super helpful. Uh, other than that, yeah, like I said, you can give the episodes a thumbs up, five-star rating on uh, Apple Podcast or Stitcher or Spotify, wherever you listen to it. And that just helps it to show up quicker as people are looking for new things to listen to. And of course, if you subscribe on one of those platforms, you can actually get alerts uh, on your phone or whatever to uh, just let you know when new episodes are up so you don't miss them. Uh, and as always, if you want to be on the show, if you want to tell your story, I guarantee you there are people who want to hear it. Get in touch with me. Shoot me an email at thegreatstoriespodcast at gmail.com. Uh, okay. So I'm excited. Today, uh, I've actually got two people on the show. Um, not at the same time. I did two separate interviews, and they're both concerning a recent trip that some friends of mine took to Japan on a mission trip there. Uh, they spent just over a week over there just really actually supporting uh, a, a church in Japan that's just uh, really, really on mission. And, and something I've noticed from both of the guys that I'm talking to is that they... They actually seem to have gotten more uh, missional work done in their own heart than they may have accomplished while they were there. Uh, they both came back very excited. So first I'm talking to Jonathan Lubers, and uh, he was actually a missionary over there. He lived there for six months or so, and he went to the mission trip uh, a year ago, and then he just got back again. So his thoughts, his perspective, his take on the culture and the, the the urgency of the mission there uh, is definitely something worth listening to. It got me all excited about it. I'm shouting by the end of the thing. And then the second fella on the show is a guy named Stephen Lee. He's another member of my church. Uh, and he, man, he just came back just on fire with just a different look in his eyes, a different excitement. And he tells you during the podcast that it changed, uh, it changed him. And, oh, it's just so humbling and cool to see this guy's perspective on just where he's at with the gospel now uh anyway i'll let him tell you that if you want to uh skip into just listen to steven's podcast it's right about at the one hour three minute mark uh, is where that starts before then is uh jonathan's time so without any further delay i hope you enjoy listening to this as much as we all enjoyed recording it here we go John? Yes, sir. Welcome to the show. Thank you, man. We've already started. Great. You didn't even know it. And it's beautiful. I love it, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm excited. Um, so, yeah, again, what I'm trying to do is uh, 
normally I'll I'll do this long like tell me your whole life story thing. Sure. Um but I'm fascinated by the idea of kind of spending the whole time focused in on like one channel of your story. All right. Um and our our church Resonate Church just kind of got through our missional sending season. We sent a team to India a while back. We sent one to Japan, to Ecuador, mm-hmm. to the Bronx. Yeah. So we got people going all over the place. Yeah. And you spent a week, a little over a week in about a week, yeah. Japan. That's right. That's awesome. Right. I have never been to Japan. I think if I went I'd be both very uncomfortable just because everything is small. That's true. That's true. You would physically be be, be in a difficult spot for and sure. I think walking around, um, they say people don't look at each other. Mm-hmm. I think I'd, I'd get some sideways glances, maybe. Yeah, you might get you might get a few. the gi- The giant man walking. Uh, <laughs> Who's this giant walking, white guy? Who's walking this around? big dude? Yeah. Uh, well, this is so cool. I uh, I did a podcast from Vegas mm. uh, with two uh, of like like lived there for years missionary gals Whoa. and man their perspective on things is so crazy there's something about like being in the field hmm. mm-hmm. out of your comfort zone and all that stuff is just it it brings a lot of just incredible clarity mm. just I, to what uh, it means to go yeah so i'm excited to hear your take on that whole thing yeah great um to start with can you go back to before you ever made the choice to go to Japan? Sure. How the subject of missions kind of came up for you mm-hmm. and like what first kind of piqued you and, and started you thinking, like maybe this is something I should do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this might be going back a little bit further than you might expect. Okay, um, I'm ready. Because I've been to Japan a few times now. Okay. Uh, but uh, missions really was first put on my heart when I first truly came to know Jesus. I mean, it was like instantaneous, I would say. Mm. Like the moment when the Holy Spirit came down and basically woke me up and showed me who he was, immediately from that moment, I was like, people need to know. Mm. Everybody everybody needs to know <laughs> who this guy is, including myself. Yeah. You know, at the time, uh, I grew up in a Christian family and stuff, but I didn't really take God seriously until I met with him. And when I met with him, I would just fill with this hunger of like, who hmm. is this Jesus? I really want to understand. How old were you? When that 17. Happened? Okay. Yeah. High school. Yep. End of high school. So, um, yeah, I was just hit with this strong desire to truly know what it is that up to that point I had claimed to believe, but didn't really understand. And simultaneously with this, like, everyone should know what this is. Yeah. Everyone, you You're every, right. everyone should know what this is. Um, and so, man, yeah, it's, missions has been on my heart ever since that moment. And, um, it's maybe a story for another time, but Hmm. it was a a long time coming for me to go to Japan the first time that I did. Cause that was the, really the first, uh, mission I would say that I, that I did since I came to know Christ. And, Hmm. Uh, you know, I kind of talk about him here and there in my normal day-to-day life, but nothing that was, you know, focused, geared, 100%, flying under the banner of this is what it's about. Right. This is what it's about. Um, How old were you when you first went? Man, so I came to know the Lord in 2005. Okay. And I went to Japan the first time in 2013. Okay. So yep. it brewed in you for a bit, then. Huh? Yeah, it yeah. did. It was like a, <laughs> uh, like we read in scripture, it was like a fire in my bones. Yeah. It just kept eating away at me. It was like you gotta, you gotta mobilize it somehow. You gotta do something. Yeah, yeah. Right on. And then so, how did the, so you you haven't been a resonator what for like two years now? Two almost three years, something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She would know better. She would. Your wife is sitting next to us. That's right. Danny's with, here uh, with her dog, and my dog is so <laughs> fascinated by this. <laughs> Um, so which church was this through or what, what organization did you first go? Right. So, um, I first went in 2013 with an organization called OMF International. Okay. Previously known, I think as Chinese Inland Mission, um, started by a guy named Hudson Taylor. And oh. I, yeah. Yes. I've heard that name. Yeah. He wrote a book. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he probably wrote many books. I don't know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I read his biography once. That's what I meant. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I just, at that time in my life, I knew that 
it had been a long time coming and that I wanted to be able to get out there and do something that was totally focused on mission yeah. where it's like, it's no, you know, partially this, partially that. It's like, this is mm. what it's about. hundred percent right. full time. This is why I'm going. This is the purpose behind everything that I'm doing. Um, and so I think I just went online, you know, and I looked for missions organizations in Japan mm. and OMF came up and thankfully, uh, man, God just pulled so many things together, really orchestrated everything to allow me to go. Um, yeah. He set up a guy who had been in Japan, who lived locally um, and had worked with OMF to get to know me and vouch for me and be essentially my pastoral reference hmm. um, to allow me to go. And yeah, I was there for six months living and working with uh, a local church oh. in a prefecture just north of Tokyo. Okay, that's a long trip. Yeah, okay, I was. I was expecting a week. Nope, nope. Yep. Six months. Yeah. Wow. What part of Japan was that to? So it was in a prefecture called Saitama. Saitama. And okay. Saitama is uh, one prefecture north of Tokyo Prefecture. Prefecture is what? It's kind of like the state. Okay. So uh, Japan's broken up into multiple prefectures. Um, the most well-known one is Tokyo. Yeah. Um, and Saitama, where I lived, was just outside of Tokyo. Okay. So uh, I worked at a church called Saitama International Church uh, with some missionaries and residents, and I worked with a Bible study club at Saitama University, which uh-huh. is a public school, and um, we'd venture down into Tokyo proper and uh, do some homeless ministry there. Japan doesn't have a lot of homeless, mm. um, but those that they do have tend to be, uh, in comparison with other segments of the population, very receptive to uh, hearing the gospel. Interesting. So. Yeah, because I've heard that, like, it's not really common for people to just talk to each other. Mm, yep. So it's hard to, like, access random whoever, right? Like, unless you have a reason to talk to them, they don't, it's like, who are you? Yeah, no, it's it, it's very true. Um, And there's there are a lot of factors that play into that. But easiest example is if you jump on any train in Japan. Uh, huh. You jump on a train in Tokyo and it's packed to the gills. Yeah. I mean, like, literally you can't move because right. there are so many people. And it's dead silent. To the extent that people have any space, they're probably looking at their phone or just like, you know, dead glaze looking out the window or just trying to... Trying to look where no one else is. Right. Like be unobtrusive to one another. Wow. Um, It's like an introvert's heaven. Yeah. It's interesting in that way. (laughs) Um, Too too much, right? Yeah. To to an extent that's actually uh, unhealthy. But for example, on this most recent trip that uh, we took to Japan, uh, the Resonate team, uh, there was one one evening, you know, near the end of the trip where we wanted to get a group photo. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> foreigner privilege. So you're trying to find someone to yeah. take your <laughs> Foreigner privilege. Of course, I can flag down a guy on the street and be like, oh, hey, you okay. know, yeah. like, hey, can you take a picture? Because, right. you know, it's the gift of, of not being part of the yeah. Japanese cultural hierarchy <laughs> is you get a little bit of leeway. Right. But, That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Aaron Lee was telling me just about mm-hmm. his, his experience on the train. It was very similar. He said, I was like staring directly at me, like really obviously. Like if I was in America, some like yep. <laughs> somebody would have started a fight with him or something. Yeah. But he says, nobody would look at me. Yep. It was the craziest thing. I couldn't take it. <laughs> the only people in the trains who I've ever seen who actually look you in the eye and stare exclusively fall into two categories. One, very young children. Or uh. two very old men and most of the time the very old men are sitting there with crossed arms and they're kind of giving you the stare down oh like disciplining you with maybe yeah gaze yeah Mm. i mean yeah there there are a lot of faux pas that you can commit in japan um (laughs) on the train just as much as anywhere else so yeah um you know if you're standing wrong you're speaking too loud or taking up too much space uh they teach you it's pretty regimented yeah wow yeah so, the the six month trip. Yep, that that's a cool n- nutshell all on its own. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. And so, wait, you said you've been six times. How many times? Three times. Three times. Three times. So you yep. went once for six months. Yep. And then you went once another week, mm-hmm. right? Like last year. Yep, with resonate. And then you went another week here. Correct. Okay, so wind up then. You, so this twenty thirteen, you came back and you've been here for five years. Mm-hmm. And then the subject of missions came up again. Yeah. And so were you just like, 
yes, let's go. Or like, how did that? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And I'm, I'm, I'm glancing at my wife right now, uh, at this point. Yeah. But, uh, basically what it was is, um, when I got back from Japan in 2013, or I guess I should say when I was in Japan in 2013, yeah. um, I felt like this is where God had made for me to be. This is where I was supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. There's no reason that I should ever deviate from doing this work here in Japan. Mm. Um, and while I was in Japan, an interesting thing happened. Um, I got into Harvard Law School. and That's, that's not in Japan. That's just for, the, correct. For listeners. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> if it had been, this would be a very different, very different story. Yeah. Um, anyway, I got into school when I was in Japan the first time, and um, I basically had the mindset of like, I'm not going to go. Why would I go? Yeah. I'm here doing mission work. I finally feel this sense of purpose and value and fulfillment mm-hmm. that I've been seeking for so long. Why like, do I leave this? Yeah. Exactly. Why would I do anything else? Uh. Um, and then I started seeking counsel of uh, other missionaries who were in residence in Japan, um, other spiritual mentors of mine. Yeah. And they started giving me some interesting perspective on things. And their perspective was, hey, you know, we've been trying collectively as people who love Jesus and are trying to share the love of the Lord in Japan Mm. uh, for hundreds of years, hundreds of years. And there's been so little progress in actually helping the Japanese people to come to know the grace of God. And so we're playing around with unique new ways to reach out to the Japanese people. Yeah. The traditional missionary model we've been trying to use and we haven't really made a lot of headway. So what if, John, what if you took this opportunity that you were given, understanding that Japan is a very hierarchical culture, a very uh, worldly success focused culture. They value education. They value names that have prestige around them. What if you dedicated this opportunity that you had to go to Harvard Law School right. and to get a job coming out of that and use that for God's glory in Japan. Mm. And so uh, a lot of considerations to go through there. Um, <laughs> but basically, I just took the step of faith and um, I tried to say, all right, Lord, I don't, <laughs> I don't really want to do this. Right. But what I do want is for your name to be glorified and I want these people who I've grown to love so much over these last six months to truly come to know you. Hmm. So uh, those five years, this is circling back to your question, but those five years, uh, there was not a single day. And I can say this, you know, with absolute confidence, not a single day that I did not think, Lord, when am I going back to Japan? Hmm. Are you taking me back to Japan? Right. Because that was the purpose, the purpose of the deviation was uh, to go to Japan. So when Danny and I um, joined Resonate, uh, you know, we we just moved into the area. We've been looking around for a church. When we found Resonate, it just immediately upon first time visiting was like, this is the place. This is where God wants us. Hmm. And uh, no idea that there was going to be a Japan trip coming just a few months later. Six months after you get there. Hey, we're going to Japan. No Hmm. idea, right? At what point in this did you get married? So, I got married in the... Oh, man, this is bad. Ah, I'm put on the spot busted. here. Busted. Ah, yikes. Were you... So, <laughs> before or after the six-month trip? That was after. Okay. So, we've been married for three years now. Okay. And we got married uh, in August. All right. So, got it. Okay. Yeah. Of what year? Huh? Man, I'm doing math now. 2016. 16. <laughs> you know, cut him slack. He's, he's on the mics anyway, but guys are horrible at that. It is really hard. There's only one person I know who can keep dates straight, and that's Chase McVean. I don't know how he does it. No guy I've ever met can tell you, oh, I met you on uh, March 4th of 2014. Just like, bam. It's like, you're crazy. You know, I actually have our anniversary. As This is bad, but I have, if you ever steal my phone, I have my anniversary. Is, <laughs> our, our anniversary is the passcode to my phone, so I plug it in all the oh, time. that's smart. Yeah. All the time, but I still can't think of it when you ask me on Darn the spot. It. it doesn't help. <sighs> you're not helping yourself. Uh, okay. <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> So you you went to Harvard. Did that happen? That did happen. Okay. Yep. Harvard Law. I was there. So what how, what happened with that? Wow. Are you a, are you a, a I'm, lo- I'm an attorney. You're yeah. an, you're an attorney. So okay. so that's, that's usually the end point. For yeah. That, there, there, were, 
that's a story in and of itself. Yeah. It was a it was a road. It was an oftentimes very difficult road. Mm. But I graduated and um, moved out here to be an attorney. Right. Uh, we chose the Bay Area specifically uh, because. Uh, well, I'll, I'll back up. Yeah. I chose the specialty of law that I'm in, which is corporate law, which okay. is basically working in business right. with businesses. Right. Um, and the Bay Area specifically, because one, that field of law is the field of law with the most international presence. Mm. And right. this right. area has the most involvement out of any other places in the States yeah. with businesses in Asia. Right. Yeah, a so, lot of tech, a lot of exactly, stuff like that. Yeah. Exactly. So, so um, do you give out free legal advice? Because I have a couple things I'd love to uh, maybe... <laughs> sidebar, sidebar. Yeah, maybe This after. is being recorded, so I'll say okay, well, I'm that's not right. actually allowed to Darn give it. you legal advice, but I can speak to you as a friend. That's right. I've, okay, after the mics are off. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to confess my uh, <laughs> questionable legal activities. I don't want to get disbarred either, so All right. <laughs> we're the same boat. Agreed. Um, okay, so then you, you've got this itch, you're... You know, Harvard Law, you come here, and this is all very, like, it's, it's incredibly consistently intentional. Typically, when you when you hear of folks in our <laughs> age demographic, like, sure, going, yeah. going to college, yeah. it's not missional or, like, consistent, right? It's, but, but you're... So if, on if, the road. if we were just talking about a, a an era that makes it look particularly consistent, if you were to talk to me about undergrad... <laughs> You're all over the place. <laughs> that, that would be a very, very different, uh, different story. The consistency really came from God giving me the opportunity that He did in 2013 mm. to see what it was to be a full-time missionary. Right. And that's when it was just like, wow, <laughs> well, how yeah. how can I do anything else? Yeah. Right on. Okay. This so then wind up for me the the portion that started with resonate then so you come mm -hmm. a few months later hey we are starting global missions yeah and second stop on the list japan yep so um i mean the moment that i heard that announcement i was filled with immense joy and not joy because i was like oh the lord's sending me back to japan but mm. because wow the lord is encouraging me by showing that he's showing people from yeah. this awesome church yeah. to Japan, whoever yeah. they may be. And so that was one of the most beautiful things in my heart, I think, is that it wasn't right. like, a, oh, I've got to figure out a way to get on this team, but rather, oh man, look, God's doing something really cool for this place that I'm passionate about. Mm. So, um, you know, Danny and I, once we heard, we prayed about it, we talked about it, we applied. Um, honestly, it was a gift that we were put on the team because we were, we were unknown entities in large part. Right. To everyone at Resonate. Yeah, yeah you were. Um, and yet, you know, we, through our applications, and I'm sure that the prayers of uh, everyone who was leading the team, uh, the Lord just put it all together. And mm. it ended up, the first trip, uh, 2018 trip, was incredible, wonderful, you know, in so many ways. And, um, yeah, that was just God's divine planning yeah. that we got to go. If we hadn't gotten to go, it wouldn't have changed my heart for the Lord, clearly, or for Japan. Yeah, because I was ready and excited to be just someone who prayed for the team that went. Mm. But the Lord had plans to actually send us. So yeah, He put you in there. That's right. So we went. We were on the team in 2018, and then um, eventually we learned that there was going to be a 2019 team as well. Yeah. And at that point, um, I'd pretty much just you know we we'd gotten much more integrated into Resonate and really felt like man, this is not just a sense of family, but like yeah. this is our known family. Right. Like clearly this is our family. Right. Um, and well, I just like, felt... Your wife works there also now. That's so, true. Yeah. That's true. That, she's she's like, I don't know, that helps. family plus? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Stepchild, maybe. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. Hey. Hey. Hey, wow. Danny. Take what you J can get. JK. 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 <laughs> um, she's more important than me. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I just... My, my perspective is... So long as Resonate is sending teams to Japan, yeah, and so long as the Lord continues to have <coughs> on my heart this desire to share the truth of Jesus with the people of Japan, yeah, I will apply for every team because I trust <laughs> that the leadership of whoever they may be, yeah. they will follow the Holy Spirit's guidance in regards right. to who's going to be on the team. And if I'm ever, you know, John's not supposed to be on the team, that's totally fine. That's awesome because that means that there's somebody yeah. else who the Lord wants to send. Well, and I'm hoping they're listening. 
Yeah. That, that's that's the goal, by the Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Yeah, we're you know, I'd I'd love for, um, you know, you're you're kind of OG Japan missionary as far as our little community goes. Sure. And yeah, I'd love for you to take some time here and just champion the the cause of Japan. I mean, we've got mm-hmm. so we've got two gals over there. Yeah, we do. Uh, Rachel and Jessica. That's right. And they're there essentially indefinitely, really. Yeah. Um, just until they're led back or somewhere else. Right. Uh, and there's a lot of work to do in Japan. 100%. Yeah. So talk a little bit about what is the current spiritual condition there mm-hmm. that warrants you know, this kind of intentional, consistent missionary Absolutely. work. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I'll start just by saying, uh, if you're listening to this, if you're alive and you love Jesus... <laughs> Japan can use you mm. because the the gospel is so slimly known in the nation of Japan. I mean, we're talking tens of millions of people yeah. who could go their entire lives with ever having a conversation about Jesus. The need is that great. And mm. that's really so much of when I first went to Japan and every time since, what sparked in me just this great desire to be there is that if you love Jesus and you're there, and you have any willingness to follow his promptings when he tries to encourage you to just mm. be for him in that country, you will make a difference. Yeah, You will have an impact because everywhere that you go, you will see people who have no idea who the Lord is. Yeah. So it, whatever your skill set, there's a need. Um, mm. More specifically, and I'm glancing at my phone now because yeah. I took a couple of notes here. Um, so Japan, as we... I expect most of us, or maybe all of us know, it's a beautiful country. Yeah. It's a prosperous country. You know, it's one of the most affluent countries in the world. Mm. Uh, But at the same time, it's a country with intense isolation and what I often refer to as like a loneliness epidemic. Mm. We kind of were talking about this a little bit before, people not looking you in the eye. Yeah. It's very difficult to have close friendships and relationships in Japan, not just for a foreigner, but for a Japanese person with other Japanese people. Wow. Um, Loneliness is just so widespread in Japan. And this leads to a variety of other things. Yeah. Um, Very high rates of depression, intensely high rates of suicide. Hmm. Um, Japan has a couple of unique, uh, I would say people groups in a sense that lack uh, completely parallel definitions or comparisons other places in the globe one is the uh, they're referred to as hikikomori and hikikomori uh, these are people usually they're um, young men who shut themselves off often entirely from the rest of the world sometimes for years at a time this means that they're living in their room often in their parents house and they don't go outside ever they stay inside largely Or oftentimes it's a result of some sort of um, social ostracism. Maybe they had a difficult time when they were in school. Maybe they were bullied. Maybe they tried to get a job and couldn't. Maybe they made a mistake that just brought them an intense amount of shame. Mm -hmm. There are a variety of reasons that a person could become hikikomori, but it's a really, really big deal. We're talking almost just under 1% of the population. No. Yeah. Yeah is hikikomori. There's an estimate Whoa. of... I, I mean, it's it, <laughs> I. It's not at 1%, but there are estimates that there are a million of these people wow. who just, for some time of their lives, and for some people, it's decades. That's the extreme. Man. But they don't go outside. We were talking a little bit earlier about the homeless population yeah. in Japan. Yeah. In some ways, hikikomori are kind of like the homeless that you don't see on the street because it's a cultural difference in Japan Mm. and that it's very shameful to have a relative who fails, who doesn't succeed in the hierarchical structure. And so, you know, if they're having this, this difficulty where they don't feel comfortable or safe to go out into society in any capacity, Uh. then oftentimes their parents or whoever their relatives may be will um, enable them just to stay inside all the time. Wow, and so that's that's one example. Um, it's like instead of uh, homeless, they just become 
lifeless. Yeah. No, <laughs> like, it's, it's yeah. Gosh, what what's worse? Yeah, it's it's okay. It's crazy. And it's it's interesting in Japan because um society in Japan, they they know that this is a problem. Yeah. But there's not a clear way of going about resolving it. Mm. I was watching actually a video just last night on um uh the ling- English translation was rental sisters. And okay. these are just women who are, you know, in their 20s or 30s who will who are paid sometimes by families to go and try to befriend and just be gentle and kind to people who are hikikomori to try and get them out of their shell, to Whoa. try and help them to reintegrate into society. Um, Interesting. They're, they're literally like hired friends in <laughs> some way. Dude. So, yeah. Wow, that's, that's a bummer. <laughs> yeah, no, it's hard. I mean, Dude. and this, again, I just, um, I really do think that that's one of these byproducts of the the, the loneliness epidemic that yeah. people face in Japan. Wow. Um, a couple a couple other things. Um, the the other uh, unique group of people uh, are called karoshi. And karoshi uh, in Japan literally means overwork death. So these are people who are workaholics to an extreme that really also in many ways lacks comparison hmm. here in the States. Um, I work in the field of law. I work a lot of really long hours, right. but the amount that I work is incomparable to the amount that these people, usually men, uh, again, will work. Right. And they're called karoshi because uh, literally sometimes these these people will work themselves to the point of dying. Um, you'll see some crazy things if you look it up online, like uh, <laughs> businessmen who have fallen asleep like on... Um, like uh, on a train platform they've literally just like fallen down in their suit and they're just like laying on the ground asleep because they're so exhausted how do you, um, how do you spell that uh karoshi k-a-r-o-s-h-i karoshi i'm gonna youtube that in a bit yeah check, check these dudes out yeah it's interesting um there are some statistics that uh some of these some of these guys they work so much that if they have families um, they may see their children for only one hour every week. Wow! Because they're because they're working so much. Um, so clearly, you know, putting their value and their purpose yeah. into their jobs to an extreme, yeah, hundred uh, percent, extreme yeah. extent. Um, Dude. Other tough things in Japan. There's for years been a declining birth rate and declining marriage rate, declining dating rate. Mm. Uh, kind of along the same theme of loneliness. Yeah, how do you meet anybody if yeah. no one talks to each other? No, no, for sure. It's, oh. it's, it's, it's a big, <laughs> it's a big wow. problem. Anyway, you know, I could, I could rattle off things that I've, you know, looked up or things that I've read about or books that I've read and that sort of thing. But right. um, it's, it's a tough place to be, to be a human. There's a lot right. of deep-seated sadness and longing there for... Uh, wow. For Jesus, that they don't know, they don't know it's Jesus. Right, that that God shaped hole. Exactly. They don't even know that it's there. <laughs> yeah, they they have no idea. They can't put a name to it. They know yeah. that something's wrong. So, what is the predominant religion in Japan? Um, so, it's a difficult metric to measure because um, religion is very culturally Japanese in some sense. Um, by which I mean Shintoism and Buddhism. Yeah. You'll see pretty much everywhere if you go in Japan. Yeah. And you'll see people uh, engaging with rituals involved with these religions. They'll go to shrines where, you know, they do a spiritual cleansing, washing their hands, washing their mouth, um, covering them, themselves in incense or smoke, uh, very ritualized, you know, bowing and clapping, giving right. an offering to, a, to you know, a particular deity right. or writing prayers to some sort of entity on a tablet and hanging it on a spiritually significant tree or near a spiritually significant tree. Uh, these sorts of things are everywhere in Japan. But if you actually dig a little deeper and try and uh, get an understanding of what religion most Japanese people adhere to, you'll find that they consider mm-hmm. themselves to be atheist. Hmm. So it's one of these cultural okay. things where they engage in stuff that has a religion, religious uh, underpinning, yeah. fabric um, in Shintoism and Buddhism. But the level with which they actually believe in any greater power mm. or anything of spiritual significance is 
very, very different. You know, right. it's not parallel to the extent to which they may engage in certain rituals. In mm. fact, oftentimes they won't believe in any God at all, but they will go to the shrine and do these things because, I don't know, maybe everyone does it or their parents no, did it or, what we do. you know, I don't know why we do it. Wow. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that we did on both of the trips that, uh, resonate sent to Japan is we went to a shrine and we just talked to people, you know, <laughs> ask them questions like, why are you here? Why are you here? What are you doing? Yeah. And, um, of course there's language barrier right. and it can be difficult <laughs> even beyond language barrier, uh, in a country where, um, people are so, um, isolated within themselves to get a real answer. But something that we found a lot and that commonly mm. um, should be expected to be found if you ask that sort of question of a Japanese person is pretty unsatisfactory. Like, mm. oh, I don't know, like my, you know, my, my family's sick, so I come here. Right. Right. Hmm. Aimless. Like. Yeah. Or I don't know about aimless. It's more, well, it's aimless in the sense of who or what whatever the ritual they're engaging in is going towards or mm. going to. Um, it's right. clear that they, you know, that there's, there's a, there's a desire. They go with the need for something mm. of like, my family's sick or I want to get this job or I have college exams coming up or something mm. like that. But yeah, it's, it's aimless in the sense of who is it to? <laughs> what, what should we expect? Is this really going to do anything? Right. Yeah, that's, I, I feel like in some ways in in the U.S. we can approach spirituality in kind of that way, our, our equivalent to that. Because you think about, you go to a funeral and everyone believes that the person that has passed is in a better place. Mm -hmm. They all say that. Yeah. Even though, oh, I'm not religious. Yeah. But that's just, I I, I would just prefer that. Yeah, yeah, reality to be true, right? For now, and then I'm going to go about my business, and like we just kind of insert it where it works and fits, and is culturally like everyone says, yeah, yeah. But or, it's not, it's not really mine. You yeah, know? yeah, right. Or we'll say like, aimlessly, we'll say like, good luck, or we'll yeah. wish upon a star, right. or we'll throw something in a wishing well, you know. Yeah, all these yeah. things in the states, we don't even think about them. Yeah, we don't think about them being religious or spiritual. It's clearly, you know, kind of. Uh, you know, pointing right. towards well, you, you have some semblance of belief in something right. our else. Thought, our thoughts and prayers go out to the people of, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Probably not really. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Too, is anyone actually saying any prayers when that's said? Right. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So what then um, is the strategy for actually getting... <laughs> It seems like there's a lot of walls around, like, actually yeah. sharing the gospel with people. Just having a conversation with someone seems hard enough. But now you're talking about, yeah. I want to introduce you to this God that no one's ever told you about. Yeah. Because uh, you mentioned, like, before, when, when you were in, uh, in Japan for six months, that you mm -hmm. were trying new strategies and new mm -hmm. methods. Like, what, what does some of that look like? Did you guys try that when you went with Resonate? Kind of go through the, the nuts and bolts of how you're sharing the gospel there. Sure. So, uh, so I think that to start with the, the, the last of that series of questions is, um, when, when we've gone at resonate, uh, on the two trips that we've gone, it's very much with a, a learners and a supporting sort of heart, um, by which we mean there's a lot to learn about Japan. Hmm. Most of the people on the team don't have a lot of exposure to Japan. So we want right. to understand a little bit about the needs of, of these people that we're in, interacting with. Yeah. And second, and this is, the incredibly exciting thing is that the Lord has already placed in Japan churches that are passionate about him and mm. that want to grow, you know, that want to spread the gospel and are ambitious mm. about doing so. And um, we're connected with one of those churches. It's uh, called Double O Cross. And a lot of what we did during our two trips is just saying, hey, you know, you guys are here. You guys are doing some awesome stuff for God's yeah. kingdom. How can we support you? Uh, How can we come and serve you and help you in whatever capacity that looks like? Hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's been the uh, uh, main one of the main focuses of um, our time in Japan uh, with Resonate. Yeah. Um, I would, to, to go back and answer the first question, I think that the biggest thing 
um, that's a key to helping Japanese people to know the Lord is just relationship. It's taking on mm. that loneliness epidemic directly. Right. right. And trying to befriend people and love on people and show them that you care and show them that, you know, if, if you're struggling with something, I would like, I would like to know about that. I would like to know how I can yeah. be a help unto you. How it's probably I can be super a weird for them. Like, really? You actually care? Yeah. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It can be, huh. can be really shocking. And, um, you know, it's, so this is a personal point, but yeah, the thing that I long for most for myself, um, I don't know about most, but of course I want the Japanese people to know the Lord first and foremost. But for me and being an impactful missionary to Japan in whatever capacity that may look like, I hunger for the language. Mm. I want to know the language inside and out. I want to be able to speak to people in a way that they understand, that's clear, that is comfortable. Mm. Um, and yeah. that is, I think, a big challenge for people who are coming over from, from other places yeah. is you, yeah. you can't speak their language. Um, and, and that may mean literally the language of, you know, uh, of Japanese, but can also be a cultural language as well Yeah. in some circumstances. But, um, you know, that's kind of an aside. How are you with your Japanese? Do you know? <laughs> Do you know like tourist Japanese? Is that where you're at? Yeah, I would say yeah. It's okay. it, it's poor. A, a small child would uh, would run circles around me. <laughs> I can I can I can. Danny's making a, a a little bit. She's trying to get me to say I think skoshi dake. Oh, skoshi dake means just a little. Here's, so here's the the test: is do you order sushi in English or your best mm. Japanese? Do you dare? So I uh, give me sushi. <laughs> so I'm one of these people who um who when I go to Japan uh and even here in the states I will try to use what little that I know as much as humanly possible. Yeah. So I'm that person who's like clearly saying the wrong thing and they know it. <laughs> and everybody knows it, but they're too kind to actually like right. you know not He's trying. Yeah, He's like, cute. Oh, look at him, you know. He's, <laughs> he's doing his best. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those people where it's, uh, if I go to a, a store or a restaurant or something, um, and I try to speak in Japanese and the person who I'm speaking with knows how to speak English, they'll immediately default to English. Yeah. <laughs> so just, just give like, up. He, just give up, he buddy. Just doesn't, he, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but I love the language, man. It, it's, yeah. it's beautiful to me. I love the way it sounds. I love, I love yeah. speaking it. So. Yeah. It, it sounds good when you yell. I always feel like whenever I've heard Japanese person yell, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Like that sounded really you know what they're doing. like extra harsh than uh. a, a phenomenon that I've noticed, and this is this has been confirmed by some friend. Maybe they were trying to placate me or make me <laughs> make me feel like uh, I was speaking some truth. But okay. um, it was confirmed by some friends of mine in Japan. Is that uh, when I speak Japanese, not I, but when someone speaks Japanese, yeah, uh, their voice tends to go down an octave or two. Right, and when they speak English, it tends to go up. So right. you'll you'll when you come across uh, Japanese men, for example, who are speaking English, uh, I've noticed it, and I other people told me they've noticed it. Their voices will clearly get higher, but Danny can speak to when I speak Japanese, my voice gets like way lower. Weird, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if that speaks to the the, the, the yelling being satisfying. Maybe that's it. It's more yeah. guttural. Yeah, it's more guttural. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like you a, get that grunt. Yeah, the groan sort of <laughs> aspect to it. Man. Well then, okay. So as you go over there in the most recent trips, especially yep. the one three weeks ago, mm -hmm. four weeks ago, uh, go through some of the the wins. Mm -hmm. that you had there what what is some of the the fruit that you saw you're supporting this church and teaching them like go go through some of that and just yeah absolutely talk it up um so probably the most beautiful win <clears throat> i'd say that i was able to see and th there were there were a lot way too many to to include in uh a short you know short conversation like this but um the biggest takeaway for me is and it kind of harkens back to some other stuff that, that we talked about before, but our relationship, our affiliation, our friendship, our true deep friendship with the people at Double O Cross, the church that we love and we support over there, they're growing deep roots, really, mm. really deep roots in the sense that 
you know, I often have told other people who ask me about this most recent trip, you know, it's so different to see someone from afar and saying, hmm, I kind of understand who you are, kind yeah. of understand what you're about. And I love that. And I support you from afar versus mm. I know you, I see you, I understand you. I've seen some of your strengths and some of your weaknesses. Yeah. You're my friend. We're close and I support you in what you do. And so that was the biggest takeaway hmm. uh, for me that I thought was just beautiful is that really got to know uh, the head pastor of Double O Cross and his wife a little bit more, you know, got to engage. There was part of this trip that was purpose specifically um, to be a uh, training time for the leaders of Double O Cross, where yeah. many people of our team uh, led them in seminars and workshops on right. different aspects of sharing the gospel and following the Lord. And just seeing the connections that were built out of that, you know, of like really getting to know hmm. one another. Um, and if, as you would expect, you know, and as you would hope at the church, this this loneliness epidemic has already been broken down right. in large part. But being able to be a part of that and seeing, wow, you know, we're, we're coming from this church that's across the Pacific Ocean, completely different culture, yeah. and yet <laughs> we're brothers and sisters. Yeah. We're brothers and sisters in Jesus. We, we, we know each other, and we love each other closely and deeply. Hmm. Um, that was probably the, the biggest takeaway because it's not that the Lord hasn't already put people in Japan for his purposes yeah. and for his glory. He's already working and moving, doing incredible things there. And so uh, as Resonate and as other you know, followers of the Lord, if we can help support them and build them up and encourage them and say, we know you, we, <laughs> you, you can make right. some mistakes. You can not know what's going on. We're here for you. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's big because it is hard in the place where there are so many people who don't know Jesus and there are so many barriers to try to overcome, to stay hopeful and mm. to stay passionate for what you're doing you know it's a, it's a it's a tough role that a missionary has yeah. to try and be in the thick of this place yeah. where so many people need the lord for such an extended period of time yeah and so being able to have this uh intimacy with other believers uh in japan mm. is immense and powerful and i'm i'm so excited to see what god's going to do um in using resonate to build up churches yeah. in Japan. And, um, there are some things I don't really have control over them, but I'm hopeful for of, of people from Japan coming to visit us and coming to stay with us and learning from us and what we do, which I, I think so. would just be spectacular. That'd be fun. Yeah. That'd be so good. Wow. Right. There's already a couple, um, of people who, um, Jessica and Rachel, who we spoke about earlier, yeah. uh, who they minister to happen to be studying abroad in Canada or here in the States who, came and visited services at Resonate, you know, so right. it's, 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 it's growing. You can see this God's knitting and weaving together this, um, hmm. this, this relationship between us. Um, this going to be, I don't know. I, I, it's exciting. Yeah. I just can't help smile because it's, I can, I get this great sense of, I can kind of see not the details, but I can see what the Lord is doing and how he has hmm. this great desire, this great plan to bring about an awakening in yeah. Japan and resonates getting to be a part of that all the way from Fremont <laughs> all the way from Fremont all how the weird way from Fremont. Yep. we live in a crazy time yeah it's a, I know that like air travel is not <laughs> super new but yeah. <laughs> really, yeah. like in the course of history like you just flew across the other side of the whole world yeah. and then back it's crazy yeah. Yeah, it's pretty wild um, so yeah that was I think one of the biggest Highs, I mean, any time that I'm in Japan, uh, as I kind of mentioned before, again, um, I just get this sense of like purpose hmm. and meaning and value that like when you pray for Japan, it matters. When you pray for Japan in Japan, you can see it, hmm. it, it matters. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're there. It's important to be there. It's important to be a follower of Jesus there. Hmm. And I think that seeing that amongst other members of the team, you mentioned Aaron, you know, yeah. Um, just seeing the Lord moving in his heart and each of our hearts and in, in beautiful ways, breaking us, um, into tears for the hurt that we see, Yeah. but then also often into, into tears for the hope that we have as well hmm. in, uh, seeing these visions of, uh, 
what the Lord is, is, I expect, you know, planning to do to bring people to himself in Japan. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, I haven't, I haven't heard, but I'm assuming that we're intending to continue these relationships. Like, with, yeah. I mean, obviously Jessica and Rachel are still there. Right. Yeah. So, uh, what, I mean, how cool would it be if we sent, more than one team a year oh know, yeah every quarter or if, yeah. we could, if we could grow to that kind of thing but what uh this is just my <laughs> yeah no yeah let's just say the craziest thing and that right. we're just constantly sending people back and forth like yeah that'd be amazing yeah yeah i think um some some things just just you know uh god dreams you know yeah. dreams that are that are that are big <clears throat> enough that we're trying to uh you know trying to make our dreams worthy of how big he is yeah. and how, how much he wants to do of, um, you know, thoughts like, what would it look like if we sent someone to inter intern with uh double O cross over in Japan? Right. You know, and spent some time with them for a year. Yeah. What, what would that look like? Hmm. You know, uh, what would it look like if there was a need that, you know, the church had over there and we were, we were always right there. Hmm. We were always ready to support them. <laughs> and I think that really is, uh, our posture of like, Hey, you know, we see you, we love you, we know you. Yeah. Um, we want to support you. What do you need? We're gonna be here. Hmm. We're 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 gonna be there for whatever you guys need. Even this most recent trip, um, the 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 primary reason that we went is because um, Double O Cross had uh, grown to understand us enough, and um, you know we shared the love of the Lord enough from our first trip that they specifically asked, like, will you come? We're going to be doing this retreat to try and encourage and help grow our leaders. Mm. We, we would, we would be blessed to have you there to help lead workshops or watch children is uh, right. one of our members did, you know, whatever help us so that we can engage yeah. purposefully in seeking the Lord's face for what he has planned for us. And so that's, in large part, that's why we why we went this year, and yeah. I, I I can only expect, yeah. given the the <laughs> the huge need, but also how much the Lord desperately wants the Japanese people to know Himself, yeah. that those opportunities are just going to keep coming and coming. I hope so. Yeah, me too. Because I and it just uh, the the energy of the groups that have returned mm -hmm. from these trips. Mm -hmm. uh, I've talked to several Japan trip folks now. Uh, several Ecuador people. Oh yeah, and just you know, I mean, I'm there's one one fella in particular. I I won't name him, but people will know who I'm talking about when I do. <laughs> um, he's affectionately known as uh, Eeyore mm. um, in in, mm -hmm. in my little friend circle. Yeah, I'm aware of who this Eeyore <laughs> is. Yeah, and I've never seen this guy smile mm -hmm. as much as I have in the last two weeks. Oh. And I don't think it's some mountaintop thing that goes away. Yeah, I think he saw something. He he saw God doing the kinds of things that we kind of pray for, but never really expect to see. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's what I'm hearing from the Japan team. Yeah, is that you're there's something about being like on the front edge of something mm -hmm. where you're like, this is impossible. Yep. Were it not for the fact that God is doing something right in front of me. Yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> like, there it is. Absolutely. I think we get comfortable here. We do. We get complacent. And I'll I'll be the first to admit, like I'm <laughs> I'm first in row. I'm comfortable as hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it's hard. I don't I don't know the dirt huts. I don't know mm -hmm. the the subway trains with no one looking at each other. The yeah. the shut ins. Like right. I've I've never I, I can think of American equivalents, and I've seen a lot of America. Yeah, sure. But sure. you know, you you can't unsee these things, right? And it, I, it changes. It seems like who you are, mm -hmm. and I'm getting to the point where I'm seeing people come back, and I'm like, okay, I I I kind of have to go. Yeah, man. <laughs> like you just should. To, you should just to see what like what's going on. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that it's it's uh, it's such an incredible. An incredible blessing to have the opportunity to be flying under the banner of the name of Jesus in a place where you're so unequipped, right? And yet He wants to do so much, and so I I completely you know completely agree and and feel 
everything that you were describing, you know, what you were described, what so many people on, <laughs> yeah. on, on our team described is you get this taste, uh, this, 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 this glimpse yeah. of God doing something incredible. Right. And it does, it, it changes you. Hmm. And I think the goal and, um, man, Oliver Del Rosario got to do a shout out to that guy, yeah. um, who was on the first resonate Japan team and was the leader of uh, the team this year. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, one of the things that the Lord spoken to him on the team in, or during the trip in 2018 is, um, to essentially, uh, take that sort of perspective, that, that glimpse that you got, that fire in the belly that you had when you mm. were out overseas and you were, you know, like you said, you were on the edge. Yeah. Um, and bring that home. Right. Bring that home. And why aren't we living that way each and every day yeah. where we are right now? Yeah. Is there, is God any less real over here? Is there any less need for uh, the love of the Lord here than in Japan. No, it, it's needed everywhere. Yeah. And that's something that Oliver was struck powerfully with. And I think it's really permeated in, in many ways, I would say everyone that he's touched since he got back hmm. in a powerful way certainly has touched me in the sense of, you know, I don't know if or when the Lord is going to send me back to Japan or me and Danny back to Japan full time, if ever. Hmm. But what's important isn't the location. What's important is that you live with reckless abandon for this king who is true and awesome and who is so deserving. Yeah. And so that's something that I've definitely grown a lot in since my first time in Japan in 2013, you know, yeah. where I had the opportunity to go to law school and said, you know, why would I go anywhere else? This feels <laughs> so good. You know, I'm on the edge all the time. This feels right. right. And then learning since then, like, hmm, how can I have that sort of passion for the Lord where I am right now? Yeah. Because it shouldn't be dependent upon where you are. It shouldn't be dependent upon where you go. Yeah, yeah. So. That's, you know, I've, I've struggled with that concept also. Yeah. Because I've taken some short-term ones. I You know, I've talked about the Vegas trips that I've gone with our high schoolers, and, and it it does, there's something about making the decision to go Mm -hmm. that is just it's just powerful mm -hmm. and it's so easy yeah i mean it's so easy for us to get just lulled into our routine i think yeah and and it, just talking to strangers i think is, is almost easier mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i know it, and i think in a lot of ways that's totally but, right but when, when you're meeting someone like oh i work with this person yep like i'm gonna see them tomorrow Right. And the next day and the next day. And we see that as an obstacle where it's actually probably an advantage. Of, yeah. Like really yeah. gospel yeah. speaking. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. Right. And I'll ask you the same thing tomorrow. Like there, there's, there's a rich mission field, you know, just on the other side of that door. I think it just goes to show how big God is in the sense that he, he sends us on these short-term trips to people, or people across the world yeah. um, so that we can speak into them and so that we can love them. And at the yeah. same time, so that he can speak into us and love on yeah, us. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's, yeah. it's, he's, you he, change as much as anyone. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's part of the beauty of it. That really is part of the beauty of it. Cause you can go and you can have an impact for God's glory and his kingdom in the place that you go to. And at the same time, be changing your heart. Mm -hmm. And so it's, yeah, for anyone, anyone out there listening, if, <clears throat> if God's given you I'm going to, I'm going to take a, a page out of Scott Taylor's oh, do it. book. He's got a lot of them. It's he's, okay. He he's got a lot it. of good pages, yeah. but, um, yeah. Uh, something that he's, that, 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 that's caught my attention that he's been saying recently is, um, if, if you feel like the Lord is, uh, is telling you that you should go and tell people in a place where people don't talk like you, they mm -hmm. don't look like you, they don't smell like you. The, you know, the, the, the air doesn't feel like the air you're used to. If, right. if you feel the Lord telling you that you should go and share the love of Christ with these people, that's not the devil talking to you, <laughs> right? That's, that, that, that's Scott's line. Yeah. Is that's not the enemy talking to yes. you. He's not telling you to go spread the gospel. That's good. That's the Holy Spirit telling you that you should go. And so do, do it, you know, do the, do the Peter thing. Step off the boat. Yeah. Step off the boat because God is more than able to make that water solid ground. And yeah. he will He will show up. He will. That's beautiful, man. Yeah. I stole it. I guess. <laughs> uh, hey, well, you, you delivered it well. Make it uh, yours. I appreciate you, it. You can, they say if you say it ten times, it's yours. Fair enough. Uh, 
Is there anything else you'd love to share? I mean, I I have mm. one qu- one more question that I sure. ask everybody that comes on the show. Yeah. Uh, but before I do that, I just is there anything else on your mind? Anything you're led to? Anyone specifically you want to like name or mm-hmm. just anything like that? Just sure. You know, the the internet is listening. No. All right. Yeah. Um, I think the last thing that I would want to say is really just piggybacking on that last point for Japan specifically. Um, internet world there's there's a lot of need in japan Hmm. the people of japan they need jesus they're they're hungry for him they just don't know it the lord wants them all for his kingdom but he needs workers Hmm. so let's let's do it let's 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 do what the lord has told us let's pray fervently that he will send work send workers into his harvest field yeah let's let's beseech him so that he will do it. And maybe it's going to be you. Maybe it's going to be me. Maybe it's going to be someone that we never meet or we never see. Right. But let's pray because God knows what he needs. And he He wants the people of Japan for the glory of his name and for his kingdom. Amen. That's beautiful. So la- last question then for you. Yes, sir. Uh, you've been a follower of Christ for almost 14, 14 something years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it seems like you're even more enthusiastic, more dedicated, and more eager yeah. to see that gospel spread. What is it about this guy we call Jesus that is so beautiful to you that that this much you know this much time later mm-hmm. would be more exciting than when you first heard it? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I don't know what the the right answer is, but I know what I I the, feel is the the truest answer. It's your answer. That's right. <laughs> um, is that he's real. Jesus is Jesus is real and he's alive mm-hmm. and he is God. And I often I often tell people and maybe it's crazy um but I often tell people who are um thinking about Christianity or you know somehow you know tipping their toe into getting to know Jesus that like yeah try my god almost like I dare <laughs> you. I dare you. Try try my god <laughs> because like he's he's not you know, he's not a, a statue made of stone or yeah. wood. He's not a he's not a figment of someone's imagination. He's not a story in a book. He's real. Yeah. He is real, and he will engage with you, and he will change your heart, and he will find you where you are, and he will pour out his love upon you and his grace upon you, and he will he will heal you. He will help you. It's beautiful. So, he's real, and that's why I love him, and that's why I am passionate about him. And 14 years later, I'm following him. Let's go. All right. Right on. Thank you, sir. Give me a little bump over here. Boom. Boom. Thank you, dude. I appreciate the opportunity totally. very much. Wow. Well, you got me excited about it. <laughs> I want to go to Japan. All right. So there's my interview with Jonathan. Thank you so much, sir, for coming in. And let's roll it right into Stephen Lee. Enjoy. All right, Stephen Lee. Welcome to the show well you're here i'm excited you made it (laughs) (laughs) what i I made it don't get too excited it's not that (laughs) (laughs) i've never done this before so um that's great i I have to make sure that i enunciate and pronounce it i know you said you you're worried people can't understand you i i've never had a problem understanding any word you've ever said so (laughs) that's that's cool yeah you're being nice don't worry about it (laughs) yeah Uh, it makes you Makes you a real guy. That's the whole point of this, right? I'm, I'm talking to a real person about his experience. So, yep, you're you. It's great. Right on. So this is the day after Halloween. Mm-hmm. Did the did the Lee family uh, go trick or treating and all that? What What do you guys do? Uh, we actually for the for the three year uh, for the past two years or three years. Yeah, we have been. Uh, Hosting like a lemonade stand, no, uh, oh, not yeah. lemonade, but uh, some uh, good. Uh, what's that called? Um, <laughs> you make a game out of it. <laughs> uh, we just prepare some hot drink uh, for oh. for the people to come by. Uh, yeah, like a, a, a cocoa bar. Uh, no, Kinda. not so much for cocoa bar. I think there was a like a. Oh jeez, I I can't I cannot remember what that that was called. I, um, 
some spice uh, drink that we get from Trader Joe's and uh-huh. just get it like just fill them up with a couple of hot warm really to the parents right? yeah and then the people same. they come by and hang out for a bit and you can... uh usually just a couple of seconds so yes just yeah. couple, like one or two minutes just longer than most <laughs> right like usually they just stand right outside so we invite them over to the front yard and then yeah and we like hey you know you want a couple of drinks you know just uh just to warm you up a little bit it yeah. tends to get cold as the night continues on and yeah, I mean, the kids will go around uh, trick-or-treat earlier. Uh, so so they had a blast. And our neighbor yeah. happened to be a uh, 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 associate pastor from another church that huh. just recently moved in. So so they were they were barbecuing hot dogs and oh yeah party so I, yeah <laughs> so so that was nice you know, get the, getting to know them a little bit more and that's fun yeah so man yeah so we we had a good time it was like and uh, in fact in fact today uh, uh, we are hosting our first child from Safe Refuge oh really yeah oh. So it is huge. Uh, they're they're at the house right now. Yeah, just lit. Uh, they came a couple of hours ago. Whoa! Like this morning, we got an email last like this two days ago that this child, uh, five years old, has been um, you know has been living with his mom, his his yeah. parents inside a car. They just recently moved out from Louisiana. Oh, so they. They're trying to get by for the next couple of days just so, so they can get money and then wow. get a hotel. And so their oldest has been struggling. And so so we got notified and, you know, we prayed about it and decided that, hey, let's uh, let's do it. So Sufa and I oh. decided to host our <laughs> first kid. And so is it a, a, an open-ended thing or is it just two uh, days or what does that look uh, like? Four nights. Four nights. Four nights. So Save Refuge is somewhat like a short little yeah. uh, like emergency uh, uh, hosting. Yeah. So, you know, really they will, Save Ref- Refuge organization will even interview these parents or mom and, yeah. and see, you know, uh, where they are at. And hopefully through that, uh, we are sharing God's love to yeah. them and their, their kid and and for us, um, uh, this is an opportunity to serve the yeah. the, uh, the marginalized and also to show our kids how to love. Oh, yeah. They're watching everything. Yeah. They're, right oh, now, yeah. they're going to, <coughs> oh, yeah, he stole my toys. Oh, he, <laughs> I'm fighting. Oh, yeah, he just throws stuff at me. Like, oh, like this. So, so he has been... Um, it has been challenging for the first couple of hours, but yeah, I, I think it's really exciting, like what God has placed in us. That's and cool, man. This is also one of the things that that God is working through me personally. Yeah. Um, after the trip. So, wow. So even with Safe Refuge, I wasn't on board because I don't know what to expect, what's our right. boundaries and right. stuff like that, but. But it has been uh, in Sufan's heart for a long, for the longest time, and and so, so, did then it. Japan came, and then, yeah, and then God is working through me through that, and and hopefully, hopefully this will be this is a step that I'm taking, a step of faith. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. So are we gonna see the this kid on Sunday? Yes, we're gonna bring them to church. Awesome. Uh, because today's, uh, today's Friday. Friday, so you'll have till Monday. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yep. Wow. And you're allowed to do that. Yes. You just bring them everywhere. <laughs> yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Oh, how neat. Yep. What a what a crazy opportunity. It is, dude. It is. It's crazy well too because I, I couldn't attend the training because I was on the Japan mission trip. Yeah. Sufen Wen. Yeah. Last Sunday, uh, last Saturday was the first was the first available uh, weekend that we get to do this training, and this is the final training, right. which is me. <laughs> <laughs> I need to go through that. Yeah, and then uh, then we are all set. And, hmm. 
for the next couple of days, we just keep getting emails about families and these kids. And wow, uh, first the two months old, now the four year four year old, and so we felt that maybe the four year old would be a good start. So, so there's a there's a lot of these out there then. Yeah, there's a need. Um, wow. And in the tri, I think I ask, I asked the coordinator when she came by our house couple, two months ago. Right. Uh, she said just a couple of families uh, available to host to, to be part of the program right. and there are like thousands of families in, in just the Tri-City area no just way. Needing, needing help like from time to time it can range from in this situation homeless to yeah. someone who you know uh, going through some medical condition or you know mm. some some um, um, sudden uh dep- dep- depression or yeah. single mom or you know, saw all sort of different different scenarios or cases wow. uh, it can be a ma- uh, mandatory court order from from the county saying that hey you right. need to get your act together if not i'm gonna get you CPA. have a certain amount of time yeah and so they usually try to mitigate that by by calling safe refuge wow uh, so so there's a need, but at the same time, there's there's also a lot to come with it. <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't know what what child you're, you're gonna get. What's so um, right? Um, you don't know what this the situation is. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Wow. So, man, that's so cool. Well done. <laughs> you know, um, God is still walking through me. I'm still broken. I just yelled at my kids this morning. So you know, <laughs> you know, sometimes kids need to be yelling at. But <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, so I, I invited you on here uh, mm-hmm. because I I think it was the, the next morning after you guys got back, mm-hmm. we were doing setup, uh, and I, I think it was it Delvin, I think, asked you to... Tori. Uh, Tori asked you to share something about the mission trip, and yeah. uh, man, w- you, you just seemed like on a different planet. I was <laughs> like, who is this guy? Like, what happened to him? Like, did... <laughs> Did we have a body swap in Japan? Like you, you were all full of emotions, and I was like, "We gotta, we gotta figure out what that's about." Um, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, I talked to Jonathan. Mm-hmm. I think it was a week and a half ago or so, mm-hmm. and so he told me his take on it. And so I'm, I'm excited to hear some of the highlights of your trip and and just how what went into that. Yep. It's amazing to me, um, just that that we have those people who are willing to just, okay, we're going, I don't know what's going to happen, but we're going to go. And, um, also that just how like physically uncomfortable that the whole thing sounded. <laughs> it's interesting, but I'd love to hear, like, take me back to like, when, uh, did you hear about this mission trip? Have you been on other ones? Like how, how did this kind of come about for you? Like what, what got you into it? So, it, I have never been on a mission trip before, and has never, never really like felt that that's a calling that I should be on one. Hmm. Um, uh, it is. It, it has always been like somewhat of a, of an assumption that you need to be like really gung ho for Christ, and you, you need to check god's word boldly before you can get on board yeah on a mission trip so it has never occurred to me i felt like god has placed me here already on a mission since i wasn't born and raised here and mm. and um i am a tent maker i mean god has brought me to, to the united states as a tent maker and that's yeah. what i'm doing uh, as the the last especially the last couple of years ever since i joined resonate mm. where were you born i was born in malaysia okay so Sufan was born in Singapore. All right. Uh, how how old were you when you came to the states? I'm not pretty recent, maybe like uh, around mid twenties. Okay. Yeah. So about twelve, thirteen years back. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. I mean, like back then it was just a job. Right. But uh, but as as time goes by, um, I think God was revealing to me that. Uh, I'm I'm here for a purpose, mm. especially to resonate and and through the gospel and just re re listening to me, do it that I'm actually on a mission. Yeah, 
but it's, it's not that clear. So, so how did it, it how did it all happen? So yeah. let me bring back. Um, I think there was a clip about, you know, during the service or or something like prior to the service, there was mm -hmm. a video clip about Japan and right. You know, since young, I've always been amazed and captivated by the culture itself. I've mm. I've been interested in anime and. Um, all the you know cool stuff that they make. I, yeah. So uh, yeah. So you know all the toys or you know, even the cars that I'm driving is all Japanese cars. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think uh, even at that point, as they were they were they were saying, okay, there's a Japan mission trip. Are you interested? You know, I've I never really like really. It never really crossed my mind that I should be on that. Yeah. It's a, I think it's only when, um, I think Sufen happened to be on one of the other training and bump into Aaron. And that's how, like, Aaron was saying, hey, you, you should see whether, whether, uh, Steven wants to go. Huh. And so Sufen came back and said, hey, I think you should go to Japan. <laughs> like, this is one of the rare occasions where she actually said, you should go. Yeah alone without the family so i was like oh okay yeah huh. it's pre pretty interesting <laughs> yeah. but even then i wasn't quite moved i asked like a question oh what about the kids what about financial yeah. how are we yeah. gonna raise money are you okay for one week by yourself with the kids and all and then she said you know don't worry you know i'll take care of them hmm. i think i think the real answered prayer is when when I went on a uh, old man's retreat, or somewhat of a somewhat of a retreat, we went to a lecture bowl, uh camping with a couple of, couple of guys. Jason was there, Bernie was there, was there, mm, Alex okay. and Aaron. Ah. So uh, during the camping trip, Aaron Aaron had a program. Well, somewhat of a uh, he was leading a time alone with God talk it's a three hours long uh, alone time with god oh. where we just you know you just grab your folding chair go somewhere you like sit there for the next three hours in the in the morning <laughs> just you and god and so like i had never had that kind of like alone time with god for mm. the longest time and during that time, one of the things that I asked about was, um, you know, God, what is my mission here? Yeah. You know, what, like you showed me so much, you brought me here to the United States. Uh, is that it? You know, it, you know, Aaron was talking about this mission trip. Is, is this mission trip really that mm. you want me to go on? And also he mentioned something about Oliver, which was the, the he yeah. was on the first mission trip and his life was changed. Yeah. So I and I and I wonder what sort of experience that would be like that God changed him. Yeah. So I asked myself, I asked God and and God, you know, how about God, you show me what you show Oliver so I can take back and change, right? Mm. You know? Maybe how I lead, how I'm going to lead my MC or how, how, how it's going to change my whole life, how it's going to change my heart, how I'm going to see you in a yeah. new way. I think that was the question I post, I asked. And then a couple of days later, I, I told Aaron and I told Oliver, who was leading this time, that I am interested hmm. um, after much prayers. Even then, I I was still I was still questioning. Yeah. Well, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, maybe there are a lot of people <clears throat> signing up for this. Maybe I'm not even, you know, shortly shortlisted or accepted for the trip. So right. you know, right. you know. And then I got a phone call from him, like, dude, from Oliver, dude, you, you got accepted to go to Japan. It's like, that's when, like, <laughs> okay, here it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> here, here I am. I, I, I need to go now. We're doing this. <laughs> We're doing this. <laughs> so rubber hits the road. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so that's that's how I. So 
so really, they they were there were a couple of things that were happening at the same time, and yeah. couple, I think God was finally showing me that you need to be on this trip. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, I've I've thought a lot lately about like what what exactly is a calling, mm. you know, what makes up a calling? How do you know when you're called to something? There's so many like ways to measure it, right? Mm. And the, like. You know, your wife just doing something like that, mm-hmm. like out of character, like, oh, mm-hmm. that's okay. That's weird. And then, you know, just, it just so happens that you go on this like big prayer day, mm-hmm. yep. <laughs> you know, with one of the guys that's like running it and and it's just in your mind again, you know, and then and then you just get this confirmation where, where it's like, I need to go. Mm-hmm. Like you, you know, and you probably know before you decide to go that you need to go, but it just takes you a minute to catch yeah. up, you know? <laughs> so, so the cool thing is that I know the mission is for the Japanese people. I know that there's a need there mm. and that to encourage the church and everything else. But for me personally, I think God was trying to show me something rather than show them something. Mm. Right. And, and so, uh, that was the, that that was the confirmation that I need to be on this plane and I'm not sure what's gonna happen one week later. Yeah. And I know that God is gonna show me something. I but I just didn't expect that. Hmm. What he showed me was bigger than I thought. So as I as yeah. I kinda recall. So <laughs> Well let's let's start to get into that. Um, <laughs> so you you guys how many in the group is like ten people, something like that? Uh we have a group of nine. Nine or ten, right. Yep. So you have a couple people that have been there before. Obviously, okay. Jonathan lived there for most of a year. Yeah. Uh, Oliver had been there yep. once. Yep. Scott had been there once, right? So you have some people that kind of know, yeah. <laughs> sort of know what they're doing, right. maybe. Um, what is it that, that your main like task was that while you were there? Like, kind of give me the mechanics of it. How did that work? So leading leading up to the trip, like we, we had a couple of training. Uh, we... I love that everyone uh, was really in a ver- in a humble posture yeah. as to like what we can do in Japan or right. you know we are not going there to 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 teach them something, but we are going there to serve them. Mm. And so that was the kind of the whole the whole team line as we were coming together and training. Like what? How can we best serve them? Yeah, we we asked um, the pastor in Japan, Pastor Ruta. Like uh, how how can we serve you? And what we do know is that they they had a they they were they were pla- they, they were planning to have a retreat in one of the mountains, mm. uh, three days two nights, and most of most of the people that were invited or going to that retreat are uh, leaders or or servants or you know yeah. just serving the church and and from what uh, what we understood from. Pastor Ruta is that they've been kind of burned out. Some of them who were leading in mm. a, in a particular um, uh, capacity has come somewhat stepped down, like right. you know, one thing to step down. So, so, so our goal is is there to to encourage and you know and and see how best we can serve them and more, and and they wanted us to do some workshops and so so yeah. i so I, so we listed down some of the things that they might be interested in worship uh, serving kids ministry mm. these are stuff that they want us to talk on and then then the thing that the two things that i sign up with workshops is uh, to talk about sharing a testimony together with Brianna. Hmm. Brianna was leading that. I was su- okay. s- supporting her. Yeah. And then the, the next part is to talk about business in life uh, from a huh. uh, Christian. Like, well, I you, mean... You know something about that. <laughs> pretty much. I have family. I have three kids, yeah. young kids. I'm, I'm, I work yep. in, a, um, uh, in a job that requires uh, a lot of responsibilities and right. time and I'm serving and I'm leading a small group so so somewhat 
It's a lot of balance. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of balancing. But then, but then I'm not perfect too. I'm I'm still right. juggling. I do not have it all. Right. Um. So for some reason, God is has called me to, to work on to, to share about my experience and what that that yeah. looks like, and hopefully through that, uh, they can see. Yeah. That they are not alone. Um, so that was that was my role in, in that. I, you mentioned that alone, and I think Jonathan kind of brought that up. That there's a lot of just isolation there, and especially for a, a like a Christian person, mm-hmm. they, they must feel like they're on an island, right? I mean, well, <laughs> they are on an island, but I mean, <laughs> like just emotionally, like they're so alone. That's it's a that's hard. It is, especially for a culture like theirs. They they tend to not reveal their brokenness that easily. Right. So 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 to come alongside and and then ask them to share, they are op- like just yeah, get them weird. to be open is kind of weird. Okay? Right. Uh, and huh. and uh, and yeah. So Jonathan is right. They do feel alone, and that's why uh, more the. More the reason why they they might be they they might look like they got it all they they look happy and joyful yeah. but deep down there's there's a lot of sadness a lot of things that they are not revealing. Hmm. It seems like being sad, those are negative thoughts, negative emotion, and right. should not be talked about. Um, hmm. So which also lead to one of the reason why Japan is one of the top societal right. rates. Uh, nation in the world and so sad it is man so did you uh you met up with the the twins yes yes let's say hi to them they're gonna get tagged in this hi rachel hi jessica yeah i love you guys what's up so i i got to sit um across a desk from them from you two for uh, most of a year uh, it was so cool to just watch them like just raise support and mm. just they're they're so joyful and so like I you know it, the scariest thing in the world to me is answering a call to like go to another country yep. and like, just live there and you ask them how long are you gonna be there they said uh yep. we don't know <laughs> till we're done I was like oh my gosh that's terrifying it is they've got some guts like, they do you girls and blow me away yet uh, yeah when when during this trip, we also saw the 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 other side of the twins because they did go through some uh, difficult times recently. Mm. Just the passing of their cousin. Uh, oh, I I did ask the permission about this. So, yeah, uh, I actually wrote about this in my in my newsletter. Yeah, and one of the things that <laughs> one of the other goals to go there is also to encourage them. So we brought along a lot of different goodies, like from Trader <laughs> Joe's, things that they cannot get, <laughs> bars, protein, right. shake, and you know. Yep. Yep. So when like Carissa planned it all out, she, she Carissa was just amazing. Like just knowing these little yep. things that I remember she was like, putting all that together. Yeah, yeah in a big suitcase, and we, we hauled that up to the <laughs> stairs, four stories high, and then. And then, like, uh, hey, uh, Rachel, Jessica, just open it up. Like, they opened up. They saw all these goodies yeah. that they cannot get in Japan. This kid, they got so excited. They're they probably still snacking on hearing, that stuff, right? Probably all gone now, like, uh, like two months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're into their munchies, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I I did have a God moment with Jessica, especially yeah. uh, during the trip, and which I shared in my newsletter. You can yeah, tell tell us about it. Um, just you know, uh, just in the morning we went for a jog, and I, you know, my forty-two years old leg is not as good as this twenty-year-old. <laughs> That's right, they run crazy girls. Yeah, they. Well, I mean, they like some of the guys joined them as well, and 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 um, and then we are not running down downhill; we are running uphill on the mountain towards like I don't know how far. <laughs> into a waterfall and like <laughs> barely a mile in I get like okay guys you guys go ahead I'll just, I'll just like walk yeah. and I wasn't wearing my the most comfortable shoes to run I was wearing my Converse and uh, and so yeah but then that was a good time then just looking at the beauty of the the creation that God had in Japan mm. uh, but as, as uh, 
so after a while, they came back. They they saw me walking back, and so oh, they caught you. They, <laughs> they they caught me, and so uh, but by then I had walked at least a couple of miles. Like I don't know, two miles up, or maybe three miles. I don't know. It's pretty far, hmm. and so so I figured, hey, you know what? I'm going to just jog down with them. I think going downhill, I I might be okay. Okay. Um, so, so Jessica was leading the pack and then I just tried to match her pace. And then I, I, I just, I just had to ask, you know, after a couple of questions, I said, you mm. know what, uh, Jessica, uh, we know about your cousin passing. I just want to, um, just want to know that we are grieving with you during this time. And then she, she just shared mm. like how thankful she she and Rachel were about our us as a church, as a family. Yeah, on the other side of the ocean, that like so close to them, and they and they were saying like how how most missionaries do not feel that they feel that they get the support mm. financially, but not this right this level of emotional and spiritual support from Resonate. Yeah. So good job, guys. You guys rock. You know. Well done. Yes. Isn't that amazing that we can be so far away, but you're you're you have the best connection possible through prayer. Yep. Like it, it actually works. Yep. And that that's evidence of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, faster than any satellite phone. It's right there. Bam. For sure. And so as she shared, she ran even faster, and I was like trying to match. <laughs> so after a while, she like oh. Uh, you know what? I've been talking a lot. Like, how did you know about Resonate? She asked me. Man, I, I cannot talk. I said, like, you know, Ray, uh, Jessica, rain check. Then I <laughs> took a deep breath and I said, uh, later, can't talk. <laughs> can't talk. <laughs> Dying. <laughs> Running. <laughs> I survived. I survived. Look, those, go- those girls really can run. Um, I know. And, and it's scary. It is. It is scary. So... <laughs> Um, well, go through um, a couple of the the just the highlights of your experience there. Things mm-hmm. that that touched you, surprised you. I'm, I'm so curious. So we the whole team know about the societal rate that we talk about. Uh, we we know about this uh, depression that are going through the whole nation and. But never did I expect that the first day, the moment we touched down from the plane, we got on board on the train, heading out, heading heading to our Airbnb, and and I was on a train full of people. It was that quiet? There's a uh, knockoff hours, and and I look up, I saw a screen. It says, "Human incident." So I wonder what that is, and then then I realized. I've heard before that people jump huh. uh, onto the track to commit suicide, and you know, huh. I mean, over here, over here in in San Francisco, somewhere, right, on, in, in the Bay Area, when I mean, people jump, usually it's just a broadcast, oh, okay, like that the train has been disrupted and yeah. all, but this is literally a word that is part of like a standard. Uh, standard screen that so often that they they have to put it up. Put it up. Wow! And like they they even translate it into English. So English Japanese English Japanese. So so the like human incident. Like <laughs> it's like I mean yeah that is that is the state that the, the nation was in and it was barely hours going in there and then I saw that. Wow! And I my heart was was already. F- uh, filled with sorrow just going through that and then the next day um, next day we went to the Yamanote line and and we pray as we go through the circle line yeah. um, you know with a with a guide that Oliver had prepared I think those guides were were actually formalized by Jessica and Rachel okay. I think so okay. um, it, it, <clears throat> so we were we we were using that to pray, and then we we just pray for whoever comes in, whatever that we see, and we yeah. see all these people getting on the train, 
just with this blank stares like there's no emotion they're not talking they're right. just like getting on some of them are really tired so some of them are just looking on their phones like very similar to what we're going through but for mm. some reason i felt like it's dead right mm. everyone is just like walking dead <laughs> um <laughs> and after that uh i think then we had a prayer walk in shibuya one of the famous uh uh business dis- district right uh, so oliver and i we just took turns just walking and praying and all the different people and the more we pray the more we were we were burdened with mm. this um uh, like that all these people that we saw that all these people that we that we interact uh, they don't know Christ. They don't yeah. even probably do not have a friend that know Christ. Yeah. And God's glory is not revealed in this part of the world. Huh. And it's a developed nation. How could that be? Right. So after that, we went to a park. Uh, it's a garden, a very nice garden. And then right in the middle, there's a green pasture. Um, very similar to Golden Gate Park. And they were like, uh, maybe... 10 families like moms and their toddlers just okay. hanging out kind of like a picnic there for them I saw yeah. these kids running around and then I was just like thinking about my kids right I, I, hmm. so fun would bring my kids and the rest of the moms as well to picnic like that very similar the difference right. is that my kids know the gospel these kids don't yeah they behave the same way they cry they fight they chase each, each other and the mummies who are looking after them and but yet they don't know Christ never heard of it so so that mm. so that this so as I was journaling in that garden I asked God God how are you going to revive this nation how are you yeah. how are you going to reveal yourself to these people to these kids to these guys or you know men wearing suits in on right. the train there's so much yeah just it, the, the emotion just keep building up and I was like I was <laughs> so sad I was yeah and on top of that I have to battle um what my family has go through because Nathaniel had a uh had a scan um they found something that we're not supposed to be there I don't know <laughs> what that is and we were playing we so at that time, um, he was scheduled to do an MRI scan to find out what that is. So there's huh. this uncertainty. While well, you were in Japan. While I was as in As far Japan. away as you can get. I know. Ugh. And then it just so happens the doctor scheduled that scan on the Friday. On the same day, I was on that picnic. Right. Uh, no, on that gar- in that garden. And, and, uh, and so the emotion coupled with that, and I know that my my son is in good hands. Yeah, I know that he know Christ, <coughs> and even if things did not happen the way we wanted it to be, even if there is really something in him, I know that God would assure him, and right. you know he'll, you know, he'll be in heaven, right? Whatever right. that might be. He's secure. He's secure. Right. But then these kids, they are not. Yeah. And so that's that's how I got really bottled up. Like, yeah. And uh, so that was before the retreat. So that was kind of like the thing that that got me like like asking God like what how how are you gonna do that how are you gonna <clears> use right there's a there's an urgency there it is right and then a yeah. couple of hours later. It just God just like um, you know use the the journey to the retreat. Uh, I was able to get to know one Japanese guy. Yeah. Uh, he, I think he came to the states to do some um, some studies and so his command of english is pretty good and so so we able to talk to him and and he told he shared with me his heart for god and how he he was a, he is a he used to go to india or somewhere for like on a mission trip and all so this guy is pretty cool huh. right and and 
for Japanese, that's unheard of. And so, so for that next four hours, as I was conversing with him and just he's sharing his side of the story, God yeah. was also comforted me that, hey, you know what? I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you through this church how I'm mm. gonna revive. Here's and my so plan. This yeah. is this is the first person. Wow. And so, but the. And then not one. I got to know a couple of more guys, very similar. One of them, no Christ. Um, he he came to the states of all university. He went to Biola. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He actually shared, the, yeah, in Los then, Angeles. Yeah, I know. So it's a Christian university. Is and and what? and he wanted to go to a UC for some reason. He ended hmm. up in Biola. And he he got to know Christ through that. Wow, that's amazing. And yet, I was the previous days we were wondering how God is going to raise up leaders, and I saw two right away. Yeah. And, and yeah, what and, uh, what is too far, right? Yep. Nothing. <laughs> and then the whole retreat, like God just like keep showing me how all these men and women. Yeah. So. Their heart is so right with God, right? Mm. That they're gonna use that, um, and I think I think God was start, starting to reveal something greater, and mm. <clears throat> and one of the one of the peak one of the things that I it brought me it brought me to tears was when. Um, was when I was scheduled to prepare a devotion that morning. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the night before we 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 were still in we still on the retreat, and we were everybody in the team is supposed to do a devotion. Yeah. And so for me, I was scheduled for that day, and the night before, I realized that I have not prepared. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> and I was. <laughs> And it was late, you know. Everybody was so having fun, was having campfire and all, and right. and I I was not ready to prepare. And so, so the next morning, I woke up early and I I I uh, went downstairs to a quiet place and I asked God, you know, God, um, I it was six a.m. when was it five a.m. and then we're supposed to have a devotion time at seven. So I I asked. I pray and I asked God, God, would you show me what I'm gonna lead? I have no topic. I don't know what to share. <laughs> show me, right? I had my Bible and I remember Aaron once told me that uh, if you uh, you're not sure what to talk, what what your quiet time is supposed to be, just flip to any Psalms. Yeah, you won't get wrong. You know, <laughs> you can't <laughs> find a bad one, <laughs> right? You can't find a bad one. So here I am. I flipped. Um, the first psalm that came to mind was Psalm 29. Hmm. Psalm 29 show up, uh, and I read a little bit about it. I, I read through it briefly, and it, it's just singing praises to God in His holiness and majesty, how His glory covers all, and how He sits as king forever. Hmm. So then I glance over to Psalm 30, and I read about how God answered my answer prayers yeah how he lifted one up from the grave and in verse 5 weeping may endure for a night but joy comes to them in the morning that was that was me that was that was uh, I was so overwhelmed by the burden I have for Japan hmm. and and for my for my, for my family back yeah. home that I actually cried um, before we bought on the bus to meet up with double across the church mm. and then within hours God lifted me up as I was having conversation with this Japanese dude that yeah. I just shared his name is Kishi so so then I I I glance over to something in the tree I flip a page before and I, and I look oh something in the tree well yeah, Psalm 23, like most people kind of know that. I'm not going to go through that. So I went to Psalm 24. <laughs> because the heading says, The King of Glory and His Kingdom. Hmm. 
this sounds about pretty good topic to talk about. I don't know what it's gonna reveal, so I start reading it. And and like I I go I go through it the first two verses talk about how the earth was formed, how how God founded it up upon the seas in uh, hey, Japan was upon the sea, right? It's an island. <laughs> then verse three and four talked about his view uh, the hill of the Lord. Uh, who may stand in his holy place, and who can enter the holy holy place, this city on a hill, mm. but the Lord, who has clean hands and pure heart, that's Christ, huh. blameless and holy, no one can enter except for Jesus. Verse five talked about how the person receiving blessing from the Lord and righteousness, um, will be able to go up there. And then as I read through um, verse uh, uh, verse 6 like this generation um, Jacob the generation that seeks him his face hmm. um, we'll get a um, I kind of question that why Jacob because it's why Abraham hmm. Isaac and Jacob is always you know it's a covenant that God has promised Right. And then verse 7 and 8 came. That's where 7 to 10, that's where I I didn't quite understand initially, but that was that was when I I realized it talks about how the gates are open, the king of glory comes in. I was uh, and then I I came to realize that hey you know that scene that scene from Law of the Rings as uh, Aragorn come through the castle <laughs> and you know yeah. in darkness <laughs> with the light and all like wow yeah hey that that scene just came to my mind <laughs> and then the next thing the bizarre thing that happened next was that for some reason I saw an image a vision of this white city like this bright city. Hmm. In the darkness, you, everywhere else is just dark, but this bright city just lit up. Like, like, and then something came to me I, and 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 tell me, hey, this is Church of Philadelphia. Because a couple of weeks prior to that, um, I think it was uh, Pastor Ryan that talked about. The Church of Philadelphia, where it's the last one standing, mm. and everyone around it was was just like you know, they was were just trying to attack them, yeah. and they were still holding on to the word, to the scripture, to Christ, to God. Right, right. And I was for some reason I was reminded by that, and this city, this white city, just hold on like just the beam mm. of light, the beacon in the darkness. And that's where tears starting forming up in my eyes, and I just roll down. And for the first yeah. time, I'm crying, not because I'm crying out of sorrow, but because I'm crying, rejoicing that there is hope. Yeah. I hmm. never experienced that. I cry not just once. I cry <laughs> when I was preparing it. I yeah. cry when I share during the devotion. The guy saw me cry. I think they probably saw me cry a lot <laughs> during this trip. <laughs> you can ask God. So, but it was the moment that I saw God has this big plan mm. that how a shame. I am to think of him in a <laughs> box, a finite God who can only do so much. Huh. And and my and through that image and through that sharing, I, as I understood f the interaction that I had with Double Cross and Pastor Ruder after that, all the more affirmed what God is installed for Japan. Pastor Ruta was sharing about how there are so many churches waiting to be planted in Japan. How there are so many missionaries going to Japan yeah. to full term, not just from America. I 
I as I got to know from a friend of ours that even from Singapore they are sending teams almost every month to Japan <laughs> and they are church planting happening not just in Tokyo in different places and then God is also raising up leaders leader who wants to make disciples wow and I got to know one her name is Mayu which is still in school and she's like <laughs> man she is this boldness in her you know for for a Japanese girl I mean just knowing the culture to share so right. boldly right that's rare it's very rare that's rare for here it is and and she's still young right I mean she is not her native uh, language and she's speaking in English with this so much conviction that mm. she wants to raise up leaders like to reproduce wow. herself <laughs> like he, she's in campus ministry she wants to raise up in every single uh university a leader like herself wow. so she can so they can then share the gospel to the to the students women right wow. girls right and yet we were Erin mentioned that you know as as she was sharing if he, he was he was he, he felt like he was revealed <laughs> <laughs> by God yeah <laughs> you know yet yeah, we here in America, you know, where we are, we're just so concerned with our work and everything else that we don't have that boldness. Yeah. So, a lot of stuff <laughs> that I shared, but that mm. is really the key points that 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 God has shown me, like personally, how God is using even this church, even all these men and women. Yeah. in the church in the city of darkness in this country that is so blinded by Shinto the religion by by their yeah by their by their false assumption that they can work to work for their own happiness right it's just unthink of um, that God is going to use this beacon of light this church that we get to interact I'm wow. sure there are other churches that are like that too yeah and this is the white city that i was talking about um hmm. and that changed me that whole just understanding that god is even present in this dark world um uh, in this dark area the dark part of the world it makes me wonder you know how how he's also going to show up in the Muslim world, it's hmm. gonna show up in in the in places that are dying supposedly. Yeah. Right. So, who am I to think that he's 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 this small? Yeah. So. Yeah, we we are so quick, I think, to limit our uh, estimation. Of God's ability mm -hmm. based on our own logic or expectation or, or doubt it's like oh no that's too that's too hard they're too far oh the culture you know they, they're just they don't accept it and and I think we're, we're so quick to do that mm -hmm. but I mean the fact is that again where is too far mm -hmm. for the Creator you know who's too far who's too broken mm. who's too prideful like there's there's nobody mm. there's nobody you know and and it's a it's an amazing thing when uh when you actually get to peek into that and you, you can you know you 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 were able to like just kind of pull open the the door just a little bit you know just see a little sliver of like mm -hmm. Oh, that's what he's doing like that's what he can do that's his plan and you're, you're kind of seeing how all these pieces are fitting together like you, you got to peek into the blueprints for for how the kingdom is being constructed you know and it's a it's a humbling thing 
I like the way uh, Scott was sharing up on the roof in Pastor Ruta's house, uh, just talking, and then he, as we were sharing, he mentioned this analogy, this illustration, or how even um, like token in his not token, uh, C.S. Lewis in his uh, the the witch, the lion and the witch in the wardrobe. Yeah, how the kids were just opening the wardrobe, like just right. the wardrobe as he opened right. up. Like peeping, peeping. Oh, there are coats, right? Like right. It's, then they start walking in there. Like, <laughs> why are we seeing like catching glimpses of snow and feeling right. coldness? And that's how this whole we world opens God. up. Yeah, right. that's how you know God is revealing Himself at, like layer by layer huh. as I'm taking this step of faith, um, especially through this Japan trip, and I'm yeah. I'm seeing Him more. I'm seeing, um, I've never felt this close from him, uh, uh, hmm. even even closer than I thought when I first accepted Christ. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> I was able to, <clears throat> to question myself, why am I living differently huh. than where I'm at, I'm, I'm at? I like how Oliver put it. When he came back, he said, "Like, why are we living? Uh, why, why are we not living as a tourist here in the Bay Area? You know, why, why, why do right. we not live as a mission in where we are at?" Mm. And you know, I broke for Japan. Why am I not breaking for the Bay Area or the, my neighbors? <sighs> yeah, right? and so that's the question I have to ask myself. I see people who are so bold for Japan, and yet me here question. I'm afraid that people might judge me differently just because yeah. I want to share about God and Christ. Yeah. And these are little things that God has somewhat revealed to me, and I I don't know. I ever since I got back, I cannot. Count how many spiritual conversations I have with people, hmm. workplace, things that I have not been able to ask, and for some reason, when God gave me that opportunity, I hmm. just ask a simple question: What is your faith? Yeah, something like that, and then and then that whole spiritual conversation occur. Huh. It's amazing how God will use that. Whether or not they know Christ, but at least we were able to have a very meaningful conversation to think about. Right. I don't know how many, like, such conversation I had. Whether it's uh, people that, um, yeah, you know, whether it's like a my son's parent, uh, my son's uh, soccer team, one of the dads mm. or whether it's my workplace who's an atheist who believe that there's not enough scientific fact about uh, oh, yeah. who God is or you know, just people, even one well, of my co-workers is a Muslim and yet I was able to share about Christ, like he, he never knew what it really meant to be a mm. Christian but yeah, I was able to use that opportunity to talk to him about what does Christ mean for me and say oh huh. okay so okay, it's wow. very interesting how God has used uh, like times like God, God moments as this uh, as I take that step of faith hmm. God is going to use that I like the way um, Pastor Scott and um, I think one of the things that I learned from the Equatorial trip which I'm sure, I think you should get one of those yeah. guys to come out here and yeah. share. They had a pretty impact time. Yeah. And one of the things, and one of the pastors there was sharing with them is that do what is possible. Let us do what is possible and let God to, God to the, do the impossible stuff. Hmm. We can do, we can ask questions, we can go out for meals, we can ask little things here and there and yeah. pray and even safe refuge stuff that I was talking about. It's just little things that we can do. God can use that yeah. for His glory. And that's how how big of an impact God has revealed to me. Right. And He did. He answered 
um, to Japan trip, mission trip, what, how life is going to be different for myself. Hmm. And we, we like to use the jargon, uh, this phrase, um, uh, what can be, what, what is seen cannot be unseen. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. So. Wow. This is exciting. I, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see how different people respond to that. The, you know, the, you, you can't unsee something. Because I've seen folks come back from similar uh, trips and they just seem very, just really <clears throat> down, you know, kind of like almost like in a depression. I've seen that where they're like, you know, that we're so on mission here when we're over there in Japan or the Bronx or Vegas or, yeah, and then we come back and we're just like, what do we do here? Or I, I don't know how to do it here. And there's just a lot of discouragement there. But I think it's cool the way you phrase it and the way you say it. It's like I'm like, it, it was almost like you were the one who was missioned yeah <laughs> right like you yeah. went on the mission but you got yeah missioned and uh you can be just as sent to the places you always go yep. as, as you were to the place that you've never been before right and it was just one week but trust me i think the the i wouldn't say depression but the sadness that comes along after you come back and just hmm. the whole reality crash you know, we, we just crash into the reality again and and then just trying to readjust everything else. That yeah. re emotional roller coaster is pretty right. common. Even for myself, even for myself, I had to go through that. It took me a couple of weeks to, to get over it. Hmm. Just because, like, you know, what I experienced was, like, such a high note and I come back, like, very yeah. similar to what you're saying. Like, oh, we, what am I going to do now? Like, how am I going to do this? And Right. Uh, I I I had a hard time. I had spiritual uh, spiritual battles uh, myself too, mm -hmm. uh, and then some of the guys who I share with underst understood that it was not easy. Um, Aaron even had to come by and like pray for me, and so I appreciate <laughs> him a lot. Uh, He's pretty cool. <laughs> he is cool. Um, so so I think. I think for such a mission, like for mission trip, for short term mission trip especially, um, it's usually the people who uh, send that get the most out of it mm. than the ones that are being missioned to, like what you said. So I was missioned. Amazing. Yeah. Um, um, at the same time, I also feel that, yes, we experience what we experience. Oh, but how are we gonna take these treasures that we gathered while we were there yeah and make use of it as we move forward yeah um i think one of the things that i share in my newsletter um you know i share a picture of myself in the alley looking up ahead and the hmm. lot of lights on each side and one of the lights uh sushi i was in japan i didn't have sushi i have i was so <laughs> really <laughs> No, Come I, on. I, that's right. That's exactly the same sentiment. I oh. did not have sushi because did you just forget? Or no, what? I have been wondering too, but because of there's so many things that was happening, like oh. we are always on, we, we were on the <laughs> retreat and then we always on the go and the go. And yeah. every time I want to have sushi, I yet I was pulled away, right? Oh man. So I didn't have a chance, but I think that was great because that was a, such a good experience for me. Um, because I wasn't distracted. I had a focus. I hmm. was focusing on Christ. And so the picture that I had, I was looking up ahead on the street and on the side, there's a sushi bar. Yeah. I was just looking up ahead. And you didn't even notice it. <laughs> I actually noticed it. <laughs> but I'm okay. trying not to go in there. And so <laughs> and so the I think that that's kind of summarized how I my main takeaway is that even as I'm back in the barrier, I, I'm so distracted by yeah. a lot of different things work and and people and life and you know just just keeping up with the Josies right. or like right. what Steven likes to say a lot and 
I should be focusing on the cross and on the gospel and just move forward mm. and not be distracted by all these little things that are temporary. Yeah. You know? Well, and a lot of them aren't even bad things. I know. It's not bad to have a job or, a, you know, but... It's, it's not bad to have a sushi. Yeah, sushi's... <laughs> I know what I'm having for dinner now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just so easy for us to get just like in this... In this this tunnel <laughs> yep. and we, we can't see these like you said they, these bigger picture the mm -hmm. city from from a distance like wow the, that perspective kind of goes away mm -hmm. it's such a cool discipline to be able to develop that that routine like like you said take your chair into the woods spend some time with him and just ask him like just open my eyes let, let me see something today and that's um uh, it, it's humbling when he lets you you know i'm humbled yeah. yeah i was humbled yeah so well right on man well it's it's my hope that like somebody is, is listening to this and they're you know it might not be japan but it could be malaysia could be ecuador you know could be zambia mm -hmm. <laughs> somewhere in africa mm -hmm. France, I don't know, mm. you know, whatever's on people's hearts, mm -hmm. but that they would, uh, that they would hear not just the urgency that exists everywhere, but the fact that you saw Christ through your obedience to the calling, mm -hmm. right? There's no losing. Mm. You go there and you win. <laughs> you see God do things in others. You see him do things in yourself. You come back different. Your eyes are open. There's no losing. What What is the loss? It, Just one step. Right. Just the step of taking that step to to do whatever that God is prompting you to do or compel you to do. Yeah. And then let him work on it. Work through it. Right. It may be difficult. Yeah. Um, and like, like whether it doesn't matter whether it's a mission trip or you know, serving in the ministry, uh, in any sort of, uh, you know, capacity for church yeah. and in, and even in safe refuge or hosting family or right. these are little things that as you take a step, it's not because there's a need that you, you need to, to feel, but it's, yeah. you know, let God reveal himself to you, to me, as I take that step. Hmm we'll be all amazed right by what he's doing mm. right i mean same for myself as if if i didn't even take that step of being an mc leader or coming to church to serve i think god would not have revealed that much i'll probably just be the guy that would go to a saturday service if, if <laughs> god willing and then watch football on sunday right I'm still a Christian, but then I'm missing out a lot. Mm. And I'm glad that God has has Amen. shown me through that. Yeah. It's beautiful, man. Thank you. Dude, thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> yeah, this is great. Um, I, I'll be praying for your mission now, just that you continue to grow. Yeah. And that uh, I, I'm assuming we're going to go back next year so that you'd go again <laughs> you'd or go somewhere else or go to I, in indonesia somewhere crazy i don't know <laughs> yeah it really depends on where i'm at but um for sure japan i would love to go back again uh at the same time i also feel like i should not take us take up a spot that god has mm. god has reserved for us that's somebody who might want to experience some right. similar stuff that I've just experienced so we'll see what happens yep cool man thank you dude thank Appreciate you so that. much <laughs> give me a little fist bump we'll call it <laughs> yeah. all right all right well there you have it thank you guys thank you so much Jonathan and Stephen uh, for being willing to come on the show that was so fun 
uh, man, seeing uh, these guys' heart for the mission is incredible. Uh, if you want to actually read uh, Stephen's like 26-page uh, e-blog or, or I forget what he called it, his online uh, accounting of his experience in Japan, you can actually see that in the uh, link uh, for this episode. It's in there. You can read it yourself. Uh, it's a beautiful story. Some great pictures. Really gives you a good picture of what went down in Japan. Um, again, if you're sitting there thinking, should I go? Uh, I think <laughs> the answer is already before you. Uh, Jesus sends you, he commissions you into the world to go make disciples. And where you go, he will be before you. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the show. Again, you can follow it on Facebook, The Great Stories Podcast. It's on Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Give it a five-star rating, a thumbs up. Help the show to spread so that the name of the one these people speak of can be known everywhere through the magic of the internet. Uh, and of course, as always, if you want to be on the show, shoot me an email, thegreatstoriespodcast at gmail.com. See you next time. Thanks for listening. All right, so just when you thought the show was over, it continues with bonus materials. Some of you knew this was happening. Some of you found this by accident today. Uh, and what you found is this is like a little secret nugget at the end of the show where um, I just sort of chit-chat for a few minutes about whatever happens to be going through my head on any given day. Sometimes it's a weird story. Sometimes it's uh, deep and meaningful. Uh, but I always hope it's entertaining and enjoyable. If not, just push the stop button and go on to the next uh, interview. <laughs> but uh, man, today, uh, so I, I run a missional community group, an MC group at uh, my church with some some guys uh, that go to the church. And last week we uh, we were going through some scripture, some passages, and just talking about the the reformation or the reformation that goes on within a person as they follow Christ. And I think most most of us would agree that over time, uh, Jesus reforms who we are. And, and our goal, of course, is to grow throughout our life to be more and more like him, uh, to grow more patient, to be more kind, to be generous, to be gracious, you know, um, all, all these, the fruits of the Spirit. We're hoping to express these things in our life. Um, and the, the question that we that we've been running around with is how does this actually happen? Like what is the, the mechanical mechanism behind this change that goes on within a person as they follow Christ? And, you know, I, I'm, I'm a type of person, I'm a very mechanical thinker and I'm a very cause effect person. And I, for some reason within me, I've just never been super satisfied with the explanation that, Oh, well, it just happens. Uh, I just want to understand what actually goes on within someone's mind that changes the way they think. Like, how does this actually happen? And I, I realize that I, I have to secede ground to uh, just the power of the Spirit. I mean, there's there's things about God. There there are His divine attributes. There is that that there's just no way we could ever fully understand the the things of the spiritual realm, right? But I, I just get this burning feeling that there's more. And I'm, I'm constructing this right now within myself and searching scripture for truth about how a mind is actually reformed and changed. And I think, you know, just a couple thoughts that I have on it. I'm totally not claiming to have this all like figured out today. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you at the very tail end of a podcast like how this works. But... Um, I'm trying to put it together for myself, and this is where I'm at today. And I, I believe, and I, I've said this before, that the work has been done by Christ, right? The work of salvation, 
uh, the work of creation, the the work of redemption. You know, the the really, I mean, the heavy lifting in this equation has been done by Christ. Uh, we haven't earned it. We don't deserve it. We never could. There's nothing I've done, you know, to enhance the cross or, or you know, to, to that. That's just not a concept that I agree with. I, I think Christ did everything that needs to be done. He did it, right? And now, as his follower, uh, here I sit, you know, essentially basking in in the grace that I've been given, and yet still in this uh, wrestling match in my own life to try to reform it, to try to change it and become a new person. And really, I think God has granted people a, a very small number of ways that we can actually take steps toward him and, and participate in this process. I, I think it's very possible for a Christian to be saved, but to be unfruitful and ineffective in their, in their belief. And I think it, it's very simple. He's, he's allowed us the privilege of speaking to him through prayer, uh, singing to him, singing our prayers to him in worship. Uh, he's given us a book that we can read, which, which is literally his thoughts. <clears throat> and uh, he's given us a community that we can plug into. And, and just like my missional community, we can talk about these things of God and try to understand and wrestle with them together and hold each other accountable. So, so, and, and I think apart from those things, you know, we can't really expect just by our own willpower to achieve this level of holiness that we're hoping for. It's just not going to happen. We might do good for a little bit, but we'll be in that cycle of do good, fail, feel bad, try again, you know, over and over and over. So then the question still stands, like, how, how do we, how does this happen? How do we do this? And what I keep coming down to is that sharing space in our mind with God himself through prayer, through his word, that our mind begins to think more like his. Obviously, our perspective on things will never be like his. But if you consider God's perspective on everything, he's, he's, wow, so there's trains in Newark. I don't know. If you listen to this podcast, you know there's trains and a fire engine nearby. But um, I lost my train of thought. Dang it. Stinking train. What was I talking about? I was doing so good. So, okay, when we read, <laughs> we read scripture, we, we share the mind of God. Our perspective will never match his, right? He's outside of time. He's got all knowledge and all power. Like He's not bound like we are in this world. So our, we can never know what he knows or see things truly from his angle. But I think that sharing his mind actually does allow us in a lot of ways to widen our field of view, uh, uh, to expand our perspective on our own uh, circumstantial lives. Basically meaning that, that in a lot of ways we get tunnel vision, kind of like Stephen was saying, that we get we get tunnel vision where we just see what's in front of us, we see the problems in front of us in the context, bound in time, and we kind of get stuck there. But I think that when you learn about God, when you see his character, when you see Christ, I think it allows you to pull back from the context and circumstance that you find yourself in, and you you begin to see things from a more heavenly, eternal, gospel-centered perspective. You know, a, a practical <clears throat> example of, of this that was brought up by a guy in my MC is when he said, like, man, you know, I, he's just, he, he says that he struggled with anger and how, man, I, I was just so easily offended and people would upset me and I would just blow up and I'd get angry, you know, but then, man, the more I learn about Jesus, the more I understand the cross and, and what he's done and just, man, if anybody had a right to be angry, it's Jesus, man, he should have been mad at me, but instead of being angry at me, man, he died for me. I deserve that punishment, man, I, I got no place in this world to hold anything against anybody. If Jesus didn't hold anything against me, man, I'm going to... I am going to offer some grace to the people around me. And and that's kind of the, like the epiphany that hit me is that it's not, <clears throat> he's not seeking obedience or Christ-likeness out of a like uh, some sort of guilty thing. Like, oh, I, I'm going to be better, you know, because 
Jesus was good. It's not really that way. It's a, it's a true, he feels the weight of his own, of the mercy that's been shown to him. Which, which, how could you, I mean, I've been shown so much mercy. Like, how could I not show this guy mercy? It, it's, it's that, you see, the, that communion that he's experiencing with Christ has expanded his, wow, we got a freight train coming through Newark. Holy cow. Thank God for industry. Okay. The the weight of the gospel, the weight of his own mercy, has expanded his perspective on his own situation and therefore changed the way that he responds to it. You see, he's not deciding to respond to it differently and therefore earn some of God's whatever, like it's his magic sauce. Like, it's the truth of the gospel that is changing the way he responds. It's a genuine response now. It's coming from him. Like it's not, it's not something that's forced or I'm going to try really hard now. It's just an overflow of what the spirit is doing in him. And just that one small example. And I don't know, I, I'm, I'm working on it, but it's that change in perspective, sharing God's mind, sharing his spirit, understanding who he is, what he's done, how this whole thing works, seeing how amazing he is like that. It just changes the way our mind thinks. It changes the way our spirit uh, exist with the world around us, and and I'm I'm excited to explore that further, and and I'm I would love uh, if anybody's got any ideas or comments on this. If I've spurred any thought, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. You can again shoot me an email, the Great Stories Podcast at Gmail dot com, or if you got my phone number, shoot me a text. I'd, I'd love to chat about it. It's my favorite subject and all. And uh, thank God for the trains. Bye. <laughs>